Hi, this is Tanmay Shah. This is Laura Greenberg and you're listening to Rocklas Radio. On today's talk show, we have Ray Yusuf. So let me begin with a quote that I heard from Ray. The natural state of humanity is prosperity, abundance and wealth. Poverty is artificially imposed social construct. Ray Youssef is the co-founder and CEO of Paxful, the peer-to-peer finance platform with over 7 million users. Ray and his co-founder Arthur started Paxful in 2015 to help everyone have financial freedom through equal access to finance. Ray started out as an entrepreneur in 2001, where he founded a successful ringtone business and then had a series of startups before setting up Paxful. At Paxful, Ray is CEO, looks after growth, marketing, customer service, and operations. Ray also founded the Built with Bitcoin Foundation that uses cryptocurrencies to create opportunity and thriving communities by providing access to clean water, quality education, healthy food, and a healthy environment via sustainable farming. I am so happy to welcome Ray Yusuf. Ray, what is Paxful and how is it different from most of the exchanges that already provide peer-to-peer services? Bitcoin was not created as a speculative asset class for rich kids to play with. They have enough things to play with. Bitcoin wasn't created to be a part of a casino structure either. That's not why Bitcoin was created. Bitcoin is peer-to-peer electronic cash. And I believe it was created to give people an option, a way out of the financial prison that I think 95% of the human population finds itself in. It's a term, another term I use, it's financial apartheid. And that's exactly what is holding the world back. That is exactly what has kept human civilization in a shambles. You know, we in the West, I'm American, you're uh, Latvian, European, and you live in London, We don't have problems accessing the financial system because we're in the golden circle of finance, right? If you have an American or English bank or European bank, you can send money anywhere. Your money is good everywhere. But anywhere else, whether it's in Africa, Southeast Asia, Latin America, if you're trying to send money out of the country, there are huge capital controls there. And it's not just by the leaders of the country or the banks of the country. These capital controls are imposed on the people by outside forces. And here's where it gets really dark. And there's a spiritual core to it, but I won't get into that now. (laughs) But I will say that Bitcoin is a tool to liberate humanity and to rebuild what are essentially broken civilizations. And all it is, is just a way for people to transact freely. No one can stop you from accessing Bitcoin. You don't need permission. It's permissionless. And it accomplishes technically through a decentralized public ledger. It's like a spreadsheet of account balances that no one person can control. That's all you really need to know about it. Other than that, it lets you send money as easy as sending email. And no one can go in and change the books like they can at your bank. No one can go in and say, you can't transfer anymore. Use this Bitcoin system. That is very powerful. That is the solution that humanity needs. Now, there's some additional plumbing that is needed to take this all the way to the finish line. And that is, on top of this peer-to-peer electronic cash, we need to build a peer-to-peer network of humans around the world that will use this Bitcoin, this peer-to-peer electronic cash, not for speculative purposes, not for shitcoin casino gambling, but they will trade it and use it every single day with forms of fiat in their country. So what it essentially becomes is like barter for money. And the money can be in any container. It can be in a gift card. It can be in cash. It can be in a bank account. It can be in an online wallet like a PayPal or a cash app. And then people can basically exchange the value of their money across borders any which way they want. So really, it functions like a universal translator and transporter of money. Bitcoin is a clearing layer to move and convert all the world's money between borders seamlessly and instantly and cheaply, whereas before, 
it was impossible. What it essentially does is creates a free market for free trade of money. If you want to go deeper and deeper into this, you know, there's there's so many layers here. I can give some great recommendations on books, but this is Bitcoin's killer app, what I just said. And I didn't figure this out myself. I credit the peoples of Africa for using Paxful, this peer-to-peer marketplace, which is like a Swiss army knife for money. And they figured all this out for us. They started using our escrow service and our listing service to do everything. People started building their own little versions of Western Union and PayPal using our peer-to-peer marketplace and Bitcoin. And it's absolutely amazing to see what they've done. They really showed us Bitcoin in its ultimate manifestation. And we're just building for them. That's it for that question. (laughs) So what is your future plans? How do you envision in the long term for for Paxful? Well, it's a great question. uh, I'm a product guy. I love building products for people. And building products is more like a religion than a process. Um, I could talk about that at length. I'm actually writing a book about it. But even more important than product is education. This is huge. People don't understand how much misinformation or lack of information actually reaches people about Bitcoin and cryptocurrency, especially the people that need it most. I'll give you an example. 2019, we went to Africa, and we did a campus tour in eight different campuses, universities across South Africa and Kenya. And it was an amazing experience. Uh, I spoke, you know, some rooms as big as a thousand students and it was a hell of a party. Uh, But even better than that is even better than what we taught the people there is what they taught us. Whenever I mentioned Bitcoin or cryptocurrency in Africa at the beginning of the tour, I would just scan the faces of everyone in the room and I'd see this look of trepidation or concern. It was really quite thick in the room. It was very dense. And I I, I wanted to find out what's going on. Why does everyone look at me like that? <laughs> Bitcoin is awesome. Why don't they love it like I do? And when you talk to them, you find out <laughs> that everyone in Africa has either been directly scammed in something involving Bitcoin or know someone that has been scammed. And by that, I mean cryptocurrency, um, these altcoins like OneCoin, who are outright scabs that rob people of billions of dollars. And the person that started it disappeared, right? And so many of these ICOs and all of this stuff came out. And so many people, especially in India, Africa, the emerging world, they bet the family farm on it, literally, and they lost their life savings. Cryptocurrency mining scams, MLM scams, Ponzi's, all of this stuff. So really, you know, when people think about Africa or Nigeria, for example, they think scammers, but it's quite the contrary. They're the ones that get preyed upon by the scammers. And most of these people are from outside of their countries, outside of Africa, outside of India. They're international scam rings. So the first thing I had to do was I had to dispel all of that. And before you dispel something and get someone to see your point of view, you must do the work to connect with them emotionally. And that is to acknowledge that the problem exists. And that's what I did. And then from there, I outlined the narratives, right? Here is the narrative of cryptocurrency as a way to invest your money and get rich. And that's bullshit. That will lead you to ruin. It's a gamble. We're not here to gamble. Because there's another narrative. Bitcoin, as a way, as a means of exchange that will allow you to build any kind of business you want, that will allow you to get your business going again because you couldn't make that payment, that will allow you maybe even to start a business that does remittance for your friends and family, to send money back home to your mother or sister back in Kenya for not just for a lower fee, not just for free, but you can even make a profit doing it. Because, for example, if you're going to send money from Kenya, I'm sorry, from Berlin to Kenya, you'll pay Western Union 20%. Or you can just buy some Bitcoin, sell it to someone in Kenya, and make a plus 4% profit. And if you do it on Paxful, not only will you get that 4% profit, because Bitcoin is more scarce over there, people will pay more for it, but they'll happily pay your mother, send the 
they'll pay you for the Bitcoin by sending an M Pesa transfer to your mother. And she gets it instantly and can spend it right away. For those that don't know, M-Pesa is the leading uh, online wallet in Kenya. It is actually a precursor to Bitcoin as digital cash. So this narrative, when I started talking about it, all these students, their eyes just lit up like, wow, this, I didn't know this was possible. Let me see if it works, right? When I first told them about it, like, hey, did you know with Bitcoin, you can buy an Amazon gift card for 50% off. They're like, what? Why would someone do that? It's a scam. It's not. This really exists. It's been going on on Paxful for years because it's this open marketplace where people will basically list up all of their money in various containers. And Bitcoin is just a means of exchange to turn it, convert it into something that can be converted to anything else across any border. And what that does is it creates an infinite amount of trade routes if you can buy an Amazon gift card in California, turn it into Bitcoin, and then take that Bitcoin and sell it to someone in Nigeria for a bank transfer in Naria. So what you've done is you've turned gift cards into Naira in a bank transfer across a border. You've done so instantly. Whereas before, if you wanted to get paid from someone in America, how would they do it? It's hell sending a wire transfer to Nigeria, and you'll lose 30% on the conversions. If you're lucky, and it'll take about a week or two. Or you could use this system. And then the it opens all the doors for payments use cases, remittance use cases, wealth preservation is a natural, commerce use cases. And then people can actually start doing business again and building businesses. So this educational part is really important because even within crypto, people are still going on with that first narrative about Bitcoin as a store of value, as a means of speculation but no guys there's this other narrative bitcoin as a means of exchange for people that need it most to create wealth for the hundred percent to unlock all of that amazing talent that is trapped in the developing world and we're fighting for that narrative every day we've been doing this for almost seven years now but now finally people are starting to take notice it was paxwell that brought the first bitcoins into africa through our amazing community and we did so with a hack. It was a huge hack. So I was talking you know, to Africans all over Africa online, and then they're all super smart and quite ambitious. But you know, once I met the Nigerians and I started talking to them like, wow, these guys can hustle. And I started to focus on Nigeria, and I said, I'm going to go over there. I'm going to meet these people. I'm going to see exactly what's going on on the ground. And once I did that, it completely changed everything. I said, OK. This is how we're going to get Bitcoins into Africa through Nigeria. But it was a huge challenge because we had to get the Bitcoins in there for the Bitcoin economy to be fertile, right? You can't have people trading Bitcoins if there's no Bitcoins in the country. The problem was, how do you get money out of the country to pay for it? It's notoriously difficult to get money out of Africa or any of these emerging countries like Nigeria, Egypt, where I'm from. They're like prisons for money, right? Like you usually have to you know, buy 10 tons of cacao beans and ship it out of the country to a port in Rotterdam and sell it there. And that's how you get money out. But I didn't have $10 million for a minimum order of cacao beans. So what I had to do, what we had to do, was by God's grace, find a digital asset that these folks could import and exchange it with a counterparty that would give them Bitcoins in exchange. And it, what did we find? <laughs> it was gift cards and Chinese gamers that would exchange it for Bitcoin. So <laughs> the Nigerians, we showed them how to get a gift card code and connect them to Nigerian gamers, uh, Chinese gamers, who would to give them Bitcoins in exchange. And the Chinese gamers could take those get sound gift cards and play World of Warcraft or any of these games online for a 50% discount. They loved it. The Nigerians managed to get Bitcoin. And in typical Nigerian fashion, they just scaled that up to a rapid rate, $60 million a week still flows through that one corridor. And that, with that hack, is how we got the first Bitcoins into Africa through Nigeria, and then from there, it flooded out to all of Western Africa and the rest of Africa. And it's just growing. So this is what I call corridor building. This is the way to get Bitcoins in the hands of these people. And there's all these new markets that are opening up. Cameroon, Malawi, Senegal, these are places, DRC, the Democratic Republic of the Congo. These are places that are under an extremely restrictive financial system, the African franc, which is not really African. It's a financial system controlled by the rich bankers in France. 
and it's used to completely uh, berate and marginalize and keep the people of Francophone Africa poor. So now we need to do the same thing we did in Nigeria across all those Francophone countries. And there's all these other markets that are opening up. For example, India, there was a new tax law passed. Plus, they're again allowing Bitcoin and the cryptocurrency to be traded. So now, because of these new tax laws, all these Indians are going to be flooding to crypto, but they can't do it on the exchanges, so they're going to go peer-to-peer. So basically, think of it like this. Think of it being in Justice League headquarters, and you're watching this map, and there's all these little red blips going off. Inflationary crisis here, deflationary crisis there, sanctions here, restrictions there. And in every single one of those places, we have a tool and a community that we can go in and a process that we can go in and help those people. And that's what we have. Those are the decisions we have to make every day. We want to help everyone. But we have limited resources. Paxil is about 450 people. We're completely bootstrapped, thanks be to God. And we're mission-driven. But we have to decide, okay, where do we go and how do we help these people? And we always make the choice to help the people that need it most. But that's not easy, right? Because you actually have to put your boots on the ground to truly be able to help these people. It's not something that you can do, like putting up a casino online and just have people hit your webpage, right? You actually have to make the concentrated effort to go there, to listen to the people, find out their problems, and then hack a creative solution to get Bitcoin into their hands and then educate them and show them how to use it so they can uplift themselves and their whole community. And that's pretty much the plan from now till forever, <laughs> but it's all a matter of priorities, of course. That's that's very inspiring. I I know that Nigeria is a very very bureaucratic country, and how how does governmental side or official side look at you when whenever you travel there? Well. I was there uh, just last year in the summer, and uh, we actually went there to meet with the SEC of Nigeria, with the Educational Minister of Nigeria, with the Vice President's people, and they were very happy to see us. They were like, wow, you guys are the first people in all of cryptocurrency that actually came to see us. I was like, really? Like, yeah. I was like, okay, great. But, you know, we, we get a great reception from government. They're just happy someone is coming to actually address them and being transparent. And they see that we're honest, we're compliant, we want to do the right thing. And, and that just creates good vibes. Now, a lot of emerging world countries have their fair share of corruption. Nigeria is no exception. But, you know, these are people that understand that what's going on, they can't really stop. They're very intelligent, right? They're just trying to understand it first, because if you think about it, regulators are at least three years behind the industry. So regulators in America, who are the furthest ahead, are three years behind. The regulators in the emerging world are three years behind them. So they're six years behind, or more. So again, it comes back to education. They're happy to see us. We just have to make the effort to connect with them and understand where they're coming from, because... You know, every regulator has their own pet concerns or major concerns, right? They'll say, oh, it's terrorist financing, it's AML, money laundering, it's whatever it might be. And those are definitely concerns, but there's bigger concerns beyond that, which they don't really talk about. And this is a big one. I don't know if I want to get into it on this question, but it it really is the reason why some countries are poor and some countries are rich. And they don't really change, right? So just trying to get this information out of them and see where they're all coming from is essentially the art of deal-making in these places. And and that's why we go to these places, because someone has to talk to these folks, and it's going to be us. Absolutely. I I know how fond you are of Nigerians and how bright you see them. and I know that you 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 love Africa and you want to help. And I know you you want to help, um, let's say, southern part of the world. Um, is it so? It's very popular in Africa, I know. But is it like worldwide? Is it Europe as well and America, or or mostly Africa and India? 
Well, we're very different from other exchanges. Most other exchanges, you know, they do most of their business in America and Europe, et cetera, because that's where the money is, right? The big volume. But we do 95% of our business in the emerging world, what I like to call the global south, Africa, India, Southeast Asia, Latin America. Because we focus not on speculative speculation, we focus on remittance, payments, commerce, wealth preservation, real use cases for real people every day. So that's where we're strongest, is the emerging world. Uh, I know your initiative uh, built with Bitcoin. Can you talk more about it? Yeah, that's something really close to my heart. So it's a non-for-profit that we just, uh, well, we've been doing it for about five years right now, but we officially started a non-for-profit uh, last year. But uh, this whole thing kind of, I had some mission, I have a mission, personal mission. Uh, I want to build 100 schools, not just in Africa. We have uh, six in Africa. We just uh, rebuilt one in uh, El Salvador, but across the entire world. And I would like to have a school for gifted children among those schools, right, where we gather the best and the brightest of all these children from around the world and take them to this school, kind of like a Professor Xavier X-Men kind of thing, and, and teach them the things that I wish someone taught me when I was that age. But this crazy dream of mine started uh, a while ago in 2005, um, after New Orleans, the uh, Hurricane Katrina. I went to New Orleans myself. Um, it was kind of just me going down there to see if I could help those people. And I met these five nuns, and uh, together we managed to reopen the first school in the entire city, which is the uh, New Orleans C uh, Cathedral uh, Academy in the French Quarter. It was a Catholic school. And because we did that, <laughs> the police and fire department could actually come back into the city, and only then did the city actually open up. So... It was just a school, but it actually allowed the city to come back to life. It had a huge impact, and that was beautiful. I uh, it taught me the power of giving back in the right way, you know. Because we had FEMA there, with the Salvation Army, we had the Red Cross, we even had the we had everyone there, and none of them knew what was going on. None of them were actually making any real difference at all. It was just these five nuns who were on the ground, who knew their neighborhood, who were driving around and figuring everything out that were coordinating everything. And they actually managed to get the first school opened up so the civil services come back in and the city could actually properly open up and be safe for everyone to return. And I was like, wow. That's the power of boots on the ground and education to bring life back to a city. If you can bring life back to a city after a natural disaster, you can help rebuild civilization. So Built with Bitcoin is our initiative uh, for education, but it's, it's more than just education. It's also water. It's water and education and honest money. These are the three fundamental building blocks of civilization. If you have just those three things, believe me, humans will take care of everything else. Everything else will just grow rapidly from that. So each one of these schools has a water well. Uh, it's more like a water distribution center, actually. And we actually managed to make that sustainable. Uh, the first school we built was in the Bugacera district of Rwanda, which is where the genocide happened there about 25 years ago. And we chose that area for that particular reason because it was you know, a place where there was so much scarring and pain. But thanks to the great leadership of Rwanda, all that was actually healed. And it was, it's a very safe country as well. I think Rwanda is someplace everyone should go to and check it out. It's safe. It's clean. The people are very nice. And we decided, hey, we're going to build a school there. It's actually two schools. It's uh, everything from baby all the way up to the age of 13. And I funded the first school myself. Uh, there was no built with Bitcoin back then. But I wanted to see this done. And it got done. We actually I built it with a, uh, a guy named Yusuf Nasari who was... Uh, it's found in something called Zamzam water. I first met him through Instagram through a great video we made about an orphanage in Afghanistan. And we became fast friends and we said, hey, let's build a school in Rwanda together. Well, he actually he actually wanted to do it and I found out about it later. And I said, hey, I'll help you fund this. You know? And we did it. And then the sustainable water well is, uh, it's really an amazing thing because 
Bugusara district is 400,000 people. And this well was 98% over capacity. You know, there are only 400 students in the school. They didn't need all that water. So we said, hey, let's make this sustainable. Let's hire two people to distribute the water there full time. Let's charge them 20 francs, which is like a fraction of a cent, to actually fill their jerkins. And it's still a great deal for everyone. Because otherwise, they'd have to go to these, you know, lakes or muddy channels and collect uh, polluted water after considerable burden to them. But now they could all come to the school, because this water distribution center, they could get this water. It became so successful that not only is it supplying water for 400,000 people in Bugasera district, but people from other districts are actually having them ferry the water for them. And in two years, that first water distribution center will pay for itself. So imagine if we could have these water distribution centers all over Africa. It'd be an absolutely, it would have a tremendous impact on the growth and well-being of Africa because it was uh, it was really eye-opening. Um, when I went to visit the school when it opened up, uh, this young boy came up and he started talking and started thanking us. I was like, oh, he seems a little old. He can't really go to our school. He's like 14. And he made it clear that he could actually go to school now, not our school. He'd go to a school that was already built only because of the water distribution center, because otherwise he'd literally have to spend six hours of his day every single day fetching water for his family. And this is the same story for so many elder sons in Africa and for the daughters too. So you think about the massive growth of the GDP of the country if we can have these water distribution centers in every district in Africa, and they will pay for themselves. And there's even a way we can show other cryptocurrency businesses, fintechs, any other corporation that, hey, you can use this to actually get your brand. We're not using it for advertising, but you know we'd be happy if they would help us build these water distribution centers. They could perhaps use it for marketing as well, and we could build all these water distribution centers. And ultimately, that's the mission here is if we can show these corporations that it can actually be profitable to do good Imagine how much wealth we can move into the global south and imagine how much infrastructure we can build. And that's ultimately in everything that we do, we try to make it a win-win for everyone. And that's built with Bitcoin. Win-win, exactly. God bless you. God bless you. <laughs> um, I know you are son of Egyptian immigrants and you moved to the States at the age of two. You started working as a newspaper boy at the age of eight make, and were making a good money. You had 11 failed businesses and the Paxful is 12th and the most successful. You, you certainly and definitely have an entrepreneurial spirit in you, but you also have a huge, huge heart and appreciation for people and for others. Is it something that comes from your experience or is it something that comes from your family roots and culture? Uh, well, it's both. You know, my mother, you know, she taught me how to do business. She's a great business lady. Um, she was a school teacher. My father was also a business person. Um, he, um, he worked very hard. He did the best he could for us. I learned hard work from him. I learned business ethics and proper business processes from my mother. And I picked up skills along the way. But, you know, growing up in New York City in the 80s and 90s on the streets of Hell's Kitchen, it teaches you uh, street smarts and it teaches you people skills on a very real, visceral level. And looking back on my life, uh, I have to say, like, that's honestly the best thing that I have. Uh, I mean, I'm in the business now where it's all about technology and code. I'm surrounded by brilliant people, but really the best asset is leadership, and leadership is all about how you work with other humans and getting the most out of them, and sometimes protecting them from themselves. It was my experience, you know, growing up in Hell's Kitchen in that time period, which was a really hard time in New York. Let me tell you, it was a crack epidemic in New York, and I got an eyeful of that growing up as a kid, but it really hardened me up, and it taught me how to deal with humans on a very real level. I'm a very empathic person. Sometimes I have to protect myself from that, but it is a gift because, you know, we have three values at Paxful. 
Number one, stay connected to the streets. And that's so important. When you understand how to actually connect with people, you know, face to face in any situation, it gives you a certain confidence, right? And it takes away your fear. And you can truly have boots on the ground anywhere then, because it doesn't matter if you have to go into the streets of Lagos or Afghanistan or Azerbaijan or, you know, the slums of Baltimore or whatever it might be, you know you're going to be okay. And no matter where it is you go, you always learn from people. And that you have to have a certain kind of humbleness to be able to do that. The thing about business is that, you know, a lot of businesses get their start because they're connected to the streets, either through one of their founders that understands a problem so well that they can solve it for themselves and help others. But they lost they or they lose that, you know, as bigger and bigger they get. I don't ever want Paxful to lose that. And that's one of the reasons why we're so successful is because we truly are connected to the streets. Boots on the ground is a huge part of that. That's why people trust us. The second value is that we build for people. And you see that in Built with Bitcoin. We are here to help uplift humanity. And building schools and wells is nice. Those are definitely things for human beings. But your product should also be for humans. Paxful is not some abstract piece of code that machines use to do processes between each other. It's a real tool that actual human beings use every single day. Remember, we're building for human beings, and that's why empathy is so important. If you're going to be a product person, they're like the Jedi Knights of business, really. And people ask me, what does it take to be a true product person? Does it take great creativity and analytical mind, problem solving? Like, yeah, that's all nice to have. But you must have empathy if you're going to be a truly great product person. And our third value is be a hero, which sounds kind of corny. Um, maybe I grew up playing too many 16-bit role-playing games <laughs> as a kid and reading too many comic books. But we're in a position right now where we can actually be heroes every single day in this business. You know, the moves we make, one small change to your product, one customer that you respond to on Twitter or Instagram or whatever it is. I'm always talking to customers every single day as CEO as anything that can make a huge difference in someone's life. That could be the reason they don't lose their life savings in a week because of inflation. That could be a reason that one deal goes through and they actually manage to get those goods to keep their business going. That could be the reason that they manage to send money to their family and possibly save someone's life. And that is a huge driver for us was how many businesses can you be in where you're not just changing how the world works, you're changing individual lives on a visceral, real level every single day. That's what Paxful is, and I wouldn't have gotten that unless I grew up on the streets of New York. You know, my parents' newsstand, I had a hell of a paper route, and, and that is really what has brought me to all these adventures that have really shaped my character, like New Orleans is one. I went to Egypt <laughs> right during the bloodiest part of the fighting in Tahrir Square. That was another huge change in my life. That was probably the biggest change in my life. It sent me cascading down multiple levels of the rabbit hole at breakneck speed and um, uplifted me really from a, just a brainwashed American to someone that was willing to think for myself no matter what the perception of myself might be. And it gave me a level of courage and um, acute understanding of things, the important things that is absolutely critical right now to me being an ethically driven, mission driven CEO of a company like Paxful. And there's a lot more I can talk about here, but ultimately it's the journey who creates the man or the woman. And it's that human being that creates the mission. Right, And if, if you're lucky, you'll be with a company that has a mission, and we certainly do. Right. You are so inspiring. I'm just ready to rock and roll and to fly and do everything. If anybody else in the audience wants to, to support your cause, to support any way they can, how, what they have to do? how they can do this? Well, I have to say, uh, number one, start teaching yourself about Bitcoin and why it's so important. And I say Bitcoin and not cryptocurrency for a reason. 
because Bitcoin, the Bitcoin community, they are the most amazing people I've ever met in my life. You will meet the most awakened, knowledgeable, and compassionate people in this community. The cryptocurrency community is, by and large, a bunch of scammers who are trying to show you your new coin. So stay away from that. Focus on Bitcoin. Educate yourself about Bitcoin. I recommend Saifedean Amus's books, The Bitcoin Standard and The Fiat Standard. It's a great explanation of what money actually is, why Bitcoin is so amazing. If you want to get even deeper, there's a great book by Jack uh, Weatherford called The History of Money. It goes even deeper into the origins of things. But ultimately, the best thing that Bitcoin gave me was an educated mind and about the most important topic and the most important question, which is, what is money? And Bitcoin answered that for me. Money is not gold or silver. It's certainly not a piece of paper. Money is simply the work of humans, human labor encapsulated to transcend time and space. That's it. It's an amazing invention. And if you have honest money, you can have a truly prosperous world. Why? Because human beings are amazingly creative and uh, generative creatures. I mean, look at a teenager. And if you put them to work doing something and they're passionate about it, my goodness, they could probably build up a whole mini civilization or village themselves. And imagine unlocking 7 billion humans to be able to do that. All that's needed for that is honest money. With the technology we have now, there's a reason why I believe, why I know that the default state of humanity is prosperity. So once you've educated yourself, which is good because it arms you with data and knowledge and you can defend your position, but most importantly, you'll be able to take a stand within your own mind and believe that the default position, the standard, the natural state of humanity is prosperity, wealth, and abundance. And once you've gotten to that place, you have completely changed your soul, actually, because ultimately we're in a battle for the human mind. And there are two narratives. And the first narrative, which is the mainstream narrative, which is what we get taught in school and everywhere, is that you know we're a bunch of uh, lewd, rude, uh, primitive, hairless primates uh, on a ball of dust spiraling throughout the universe at some crazy speed. There's a whole bunch of other balls of dust out there and we're insignificant, we're nothing, we're you know brutal and mean and violent and we just like to destroy things and we're, oh, we started off poor and well, no. That is completely wrong. It is exactly wrong. Now what would be the exact opposite of that? That we are a blessed, good creation that is loving, that is kind, that is generative, that is incredibly creative, that if we just are able to work with each other and that we want to work with each other, you don't see babies being racist to each other, we will create a world of prosperity, abundance, and wealth for everyone. Wealth for the 100%, not the 1%. Once you get to that place in your mind, you will literally become an antenna of power, a tower of power. People will hear you. You will infect others with this strength. And this is our only real shot right now, guys. Because we're living in a world where we see the dawn, the curtain of war is coming upon all of us. But the bad guys are getting real scared right now. They see Bitcoin happening. They see all this education happening. They see all these heroes rising up all over the world. And they're trying to bring this curtain of pain and misinformation and just annoyance down on everyone, whether it's making us all wear burkas, not wanting us to breathe or travel, or all this other garbage they're putting out, they're scared, because you know that we're rising up. And once you as a human being accept that the natural state of humanity is wealth, prosperity, and abundance, and you know exactly why that is and what is needed to do that, you will then have the spiritual knowledge to know why we are not in that prosperous state. You will know who the enemy is. And once you have that, you have the totality of everything needed to be a true freedom fighter. And you may go out and save the damn world, starting with your block and your group of friends. That's all I'm asking. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, all right, bro. <laughs> sure, man. <laughs> Uh, yeah, <laughs> few few things. <laughs> You're like, I'll get started on that right away. Yeah.
<laughs> yeah. No, I, I completely agree that everything starts within yourself and everything starts in your own mind. And you have to think big to to change something. I mean, you, you can think little, but I mean, what's the point if you can also as well think big, right? You should think big, but you should act in, in you know, a very small area first, test things out, build your confidence, and you move from there. Small victories lead up to big ones, right? As long as you just, you unlock that creativity and that, that grandness inside your own mind, right? That's the key. And everyone deserves that. Let's... Let's talk a little bit more about money and then we talk about something lifestyle and, and that. Uh, what do you think is the future of money now with, the, with, with crypto and DeFi and everything? Yeah, well, I mean, we're seeing the, the formation of this, this web of money right now that is outside the control of these you know broken and <laughs> primitive banking rails built on this ancient technology you know like the american swift system of the ach system in america is like 50 years old swift is a swift is a the banking network swift that literally moves all the money around the world globally is a completely global uh broken uh factional tribal federated system of just you know stupidity ignorance and incompetence that's the past now because we have the internet and we have peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash and we have all this amazing plumbing that's being built on top of it like with DeFi, you're literally seeing the creativity of humanity all these problems that were there are being solved with all these little projects that are turning into big projects DeFi is a huge part of that <laughs> it's currently just a circle jerk right now a bunch of you know young DJs um, <laughs> playing games with all this money, but it will reach the mainstream soon. It is that's part of our job, and you're going to see the entire system change. But it's a battle, guys. Like they know this, the bad guys know this is coming. They know this is going to completely upend their their ability to control people because there are three pillars of power when it comes to human civilization. There's the financial pillar which, you know, if you're smart, you'll take control of first. Because once you have control of the financial pillar and you can control the volume of currency in every economy, you can decide who's rich or poor, you can punish or reward, you are then able to create money out of nothing and purchase control of the media, which will give you control of people's minds, which will then allow you to achieve, that's the second uh, pillar of power is media control once you have that it'll allow you to achieve the third pillar take control of that which is political control which ultimately leads to military control control of armies and navies and then you can create all these chaos with these wars that you are able to fund with this fake money that you created and all this propaganda that you spat out and you'll be able to ensure that at the end of all of that you actually have more of real control not just over mouthpieces and businesses, but over the means of production on a very core level. And that's what happens in every war. There's a complete restructuring of the world, right? And what is it all leading up to? Well, that's a spiritual question. We don't need to get into that now, but it's a battle. And the reason I bring it up is because you have to understand that this thing, it's, you know, Everything that's happening geopolitically in the world, you know, once we all start going down the rabbit hole, we'll start saying, oh, yeah, they're just doing it for money. All these drugs, they're trying to sell us for money. All these masks, all this, this, that, like, they just want money. But no, if central bankers are able to create money from nothing, then money is not their end goal. They can create it from nothing. Why do they care about money? Just a tool to control the serving class, whether they're billionaire CEO or just a guy, you know, putting together shoes on an assembly line, they're all the same to them because we have to work for our money. No matter how successful I am, I'm still working for my money. I can't create money out of nothing like these guys can. So I'm still their slave. And so are you if you're listening to this and you can't create money out of thin air. You're still a slave too. So we're all in the same boat. 
So they're not doing this for money. Question is, why are they doing it? I'll leave you guys to figure that out. But it's certainly not for money. So once you get there, guys, you'll be able to understand where things are going. But you don't have to go that deep down the rabbit hole. That's only for the very few. What I suggest you guys do is you go out there and you start playing around with some of the amazing financial products out there. Whether it's collateralized lending, for example, you can put up 150, you can put up 150% collateral of your Bitcoin or Ethereum or whatever, and then you can borrow out um, uh, USDT, US dollars from that, which you can spend. That's a great example of some of these fintech products out there right now. Imagine if you could take that out of this small DeFi space and put it into the global south and allow people in the west to lend money to people in the global south. At, so, you know, they'd earn way more than 3% APY and people in the global south wouldn't have to pay 30% a month, borrow 200 bucks. They could just pay one third of that and everyone would still win. So go out there and use some products. It'll teach you how the history of money is going to look like, but it's not just going to be one system anymore. There's going to be all these blockchains, all these different systems, all these different products. There's going to be so much to choose from, which is good, but it can also create a lot of noise, and it can create a lot of room for error and pain and scams, right? So, again, we have to be more on the ball now than ever before we'll have more options than ever before um the world is getting more digitalized and in in a good way but also that in a way i feel like people are losing some sort of connection which on on the good uh, side that peer-to-peer -peer everything, more possibilities, less border, uh, economical freedom, possibilities in, in the areas and, and regions where it wasn't available, like possible before. But what about also the environmental changes? What about these people connections? So there is like duality of the good and bad. What What is your comment on that? What do you think about it? You mean the people that are saying like Bitcoin is bad for the environment or... No, no, the, exactly the digitalization and how that brings maybe to connecting between in real life people and human connection. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, I'll keep it simple. We got to get outside more, brothers and sisters. Do not be stuck at home on your computer, you know, just doing all this DGEN stuff all day. I'm a nerd. I'm a major nerd. All I do is work all day, but... Uh, we have to keep it real. We have to take care of our bodies. We have to eat right. We have to work out, lift weights, live a good, strong life there. Life does not exist in the metaverse, all right? Fuck the metaverse. I'm tired of hearing that crap. We don't need that shit. We need to get our work done, play some games or whatever, but we don't live inside computers. We're human beings with real physical bodies, and that's a blessing. Let's go out there and actually use them. You know, there's no, the metaverse, the multiverse, these are all honestly diabolical concoctions to just distract us from our true power, which is to affect change in the real world, right? You know, NFTs are amazing technology. We can use them for good things. But <laughs> remember, this battle is not going to be won in digital reality. It's going to be won in the real world, you know, on the streets. Never forget that. And always put, your body and your physical well-being above everything else and keep your screen time limited folks wish my mama told me that she did actually i didn't listen well hey <laughs> it all comes with time right <laughs> uh i don't know if you have seen there was a video where iceland uh was trolling Mark Zuckerberg and saying, like, live in this universe. It's real. You can play with water and splash it. It was funny. What is your lifestyle? Is With your all traveling, with your passion to your work, I assume you're a workaholic. And so how do you really keep that, that healthy lifestyle? Uh, well, you have to go to the gym, lift weights, eat right. This is important. Uh, it's a, I think bodybuilding is a great thing for people to be into, especially if you're older. Uh, that's important for the body. So go to the gym five times a week, eat, you know, 
high protein, high fat foods, limit your carbs, basic stuff. Uh, the other part of it is the spiritual part, and uh, that's the hard one. Because look, we're living in a world where this world is meant to test us. You could call God an enlightened game designer. The game wouldn't be fun if it wasn't, you know, hard. It has to be hard. So the longer you live in this world, the more it seeks to break you down. And the more connected you are spiritually, the more under attack you're going to be by dark spiritual forces, which manifest as things like mental illness, schizophrenia, whatever it is, stress. So the only way to truly be healed is to do something that connects you with the force, with God's creation, going out into nature, meditation, prayer works very well for me. That's the only thing that honestly keeps me together. Um, some people think I'm a playboy, uh, maybe when they see me, but uh, <laughs> couldn't be farther from the truth. Um, more of like a monk and a, a nerd, and I'm just trying to get things done, right? Uh, <laughs> I live a very quiet life. I'm very selective with my company, and I focus on myself primarily on what I have to do. I surround myself with great people, people that I can trust, people that are mission-driven. And when I'm not with them, I'm usually trying to find people like them, or I'm praying that more of those people enter my life. That is ultimately my job as a CEO is to attract and retain not just great talent, but open hearts that can really help me out in this thing because not no one man can do this themselves. Even an army can't do this themselves. You need true believers that understand the mission and that you can trust, especially in this business. And my whole life revolves around that. And God, of course. God is the reason I'm here. I was homeless eight years ago. And now I'm here, and that doesn't just happen because I work hard. That happens by the will of the Creator, and I'll never, ever apologize for saying that, nor should anyone. You said you do yoga and meditation. How often do you do them? Uh, yoga I haven't done for some time, actually, but I found a really good guy here. I'm going to do so soon. But I kind of do my own uh, like stretching routine every morning. I wake up in my room, and I have my own stretching yoga Pilates routine. I have very tight hips like most of us men do. So I really work to open that up. Uh, breathing is very important as I do that. I absolutely need that for my routine. Between that, weightlifting, and eating right, you can actually have a pretty awesome life. So yoga is great, guys. Pilates is good. Whatever makes sense for you, you have to know your own body well. Right? Don't be a, a lot of men are afraid of knowing their own bodies well and doing these things, but it's absolutely a very manly thing to do, guys. So get with it. Take care of yourself, everybody. Um, what time do you wake up and what is your morning routine? Uh, do you drink coffee, tea? What, what is your morning routine? What time you start your work after waking up? Yeah, so the morning routine really starts uh, at 9.30 at night when I go to sleep or when I should go to sleep. Uh, and I, past 9.30 is way past my bedtime, so I'm not a very fun guy to go out with because I crash really early. And, you know, before when you go to sleep, you should have things on your mind or have a conversation with God, however you want to phrase it, where you'll, you'll reminisce over the day. It's almost like keeping a diary. You can choose to write it down, which is even better. Sometimes I do that. I... I do a daily report for myself, and uh, I number it by the number of days that I've been alive. I believe I'm on 16,493, third day in my life right now, uh, for, no, 400, and, anyway, uh, and seventh day, I'm sorry, of my life right now, and I, I'll just write it down. Sometimes I won't, but that really sets the stage for an amazing morning. Just assuming you have a good night of sleep. And sleep is very important, guys. You're not just resting your body. You know, you're, when you enter that REM sleep, what happens is you're, according to a lot of the hermetic traditions, like your soul will literally leave your body, rise up to the heavens, get a recharge, and come back down into your body, right? So it's important. That's why if you don't get that kind of sleep, you really are, your spiritual bodies are not recharged. So I like to wake up an hour before sunrise. It's a very special time. You know, that's the time uh, where, you know, alchemists would uh, 
they would rise and actually go to the forest and collect the dew from the grass, right? Because that was actually the fuel for all of these alchemical experiments that also, non-coincidentally, happens to be the prayer time for Muslims, for or, uh, Orthodox Jews, for Coptic Christians, right? An hour before sunrise. It's a very special time. That's the time that they say destiny falls from the heavens, right? It's Sometimes it may happen when you're in the toilet, but that's really a joke. It really happens at those times, an hour before sunrise, wherever you might be. I wake up, I'll pray. And then if I've slept late, I will go back to sleep right after that and get some more shut eye. And then I'll wake up again and I'll start my stretching routine, my morning routine. I'll have some coffee or green tea. Green tea, I'm switching over to that now. I'll eat a good hearty breakfast or have a protein shake. It's very important to get to break your fast, you know, while you've been sleeping with some high protein rich foods. And from there, now I think about my day, right? What am I going to do? Of course, you know, you cleanse yourself. Um, the great thing about prayer is you have to pray. You have to cleanse your body, do the evolution before you pray. And prayer for me is the thing that really works. It begins my whole day because there's a special position when you pray. And this is, this is the way Jesus prayed. This is the way all Muslims pray. This is the way Orthodox Jews pray. It's, it's mentioned in Matthew, uh, Matthew 24, 13, where it says Jesus put seven points on the ground, including his head, and prayed. It's like 11 times in the Old Testament. That position is called sujud in Arabic. It's very powerful. They say that's when you're closest to God. It's when you put seven points, your hands, your knees, your feet, and your head, put it to the ground, you get that grounding, that energy, and you're in a state of complete prostration where you're worshiping this this force that is greater than you. And you can ask for anything, right? You can ask for the biggest thing. You can ask for the littlest thing. You know, God always wants to hear from us. That is my superpower. Literally everything I've asked for in that state of worship, I've got everything. That's the best advice I can give any human being alive on that planet. It doesn't matter what religion you are, what language you speak. You don't even have to get in that position if you want to, but you have to pour your soul into that. But if you want to go all out, that's how you worship, guys, right there. Anything other than that is like having sex with your clothes on, honestly. <laughs> Part of the pun. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I pray, but I will look up to this, and I'm, I'm very curious about different cultures and customs so i'm definitely looking this up on for myself awesome. do you read right. books Thank you. yeah i used to be a major nerd uh well i still am a nerd <laughs> that's more of a dweeb actually that's not going to change um there's been periods in my life especially when i was falling through the rabbit hole where i would literally devour books i mean just devour them like i had a very special way of reading books, which I always thought was strange, but some of my heroes throughout history actually found that they read books the same way. I'll always read a book backwards. I'll read the conclusion first. Sometimes I read it backwards. And then I'll go to the index and find what chapters are interesting to me. And sometimes I'll read them, sometimes backwards as well. That allows me to really get into the soul of a book. And I really like books because you can really bond with the writer of the book. You almost feel who they are. Um, I don't like fiction. I haven't read much fiction since I was a kid. Um, but when I did read fiction, it was things like Beowulf and poetry and whatnot. I haven't read poetry for a very long time. But I had a period of my life where I spent, you know, three years just devouring all these Victorian-era science books. And I'm not going to get into that right now. But uh, that was probably the that and all this revisionist history that I read where I, I went very, very deep. Like, I'm just someone that has to get to the logical conclusion of everything. I don't believe God would give us a mind and not expect us to use the gift of logical reasoning and thought to figure things out. That being said, logic alone can only take you so far. It can only help you, you know, you know, make a big step towards something, but ultimately to get to the ideas that count, it's like jumping across a, a canyon, a chasm, 
And you're not going to be able to do that unless you have an open heart. And that, again, comes with the force, right? Your connection to the creator. However, which, which way you choose to do that, that's the true power of humans. Um, as of right now, I, I don't read many books right now. I'm just reading papers and listening to podcasts. Um, sometimes I'll go back and I'll reread these <laughs> old science books because they really do engage my mind. Um, there's some amazing ones I can suggest, but I, I really like those books because, you know, instead of all this quantum physics stuff that everyone's into now, which absolutely makes no sense to me whatsoever, I'm not ashamed to say that. If people don't like that, well, good for you. You might understand it. I don't. It sounds like total crap to me. It doesn't appeal to natural. You can problems. leave the space then. <laughs> exactly. You can bail then. But if you, for example, look up a guy named J.J. Thompson. He uh, was one of these Victorian area guys. Scotsman living in um, Oxford, the Royal Cavendish Labs. Uh, he was probably one of the greatest minds humanity has ever seen. He's definitely the greatest experimenter that ever lived. He won a Nobel Prize for the discovery of the electron. His son won a Nobel Prize. All seven of his research assistants won Nobel Prizes. And if you read any of his books, you'll see how he explains the most complex things in the simplest possible way, which is the exact opposite of what we get now. And when you read that, and you look at the crap that we have now, you'll see, wait a minute, something is wrong. And it's always very comforting to me to be able to go back and, and just read the words. of the, These are the guys that gave us all of the engineering that we have that fuels the entire modern age. These quantum physics clowns have given us absolutely nothing. Worthless papers that seem they were generated by some kind of bogus AI. Anyway, <laughs> that's enough about that. <laughs> too much controversy on this call. Do you do you read physical books, printed books, or you you listen to audio books? I really prefer to read physical books. You can really get a feel. Like I almost feel like I'm channeling the guy that wrote it. Where your physical book, I know it sounds corny, but it's true. Uh, audio books, yeah. I mean, uh, usually about business, or I'll listen to people in crypto about that. But if if I'm really going to dig into something deeply, I want to see the world with my eyes I just like that i like to draw with my hands i like to touch things what post podcast do you listen mostly everything i can find in crypto you listen to guys like michael saylor you know listening to some of the top podcasts in the space pump along with culture. usually the podcast that i'm going to be on i'll listen to them beforehand just to get some insight in, into their style and prepare uh, because otherwise, I just go off on my monologues, which is not bad, but I do like to prepare. Um, other than that, I prefer to read the physical books. Uh, they're mostly like if I listen to a podcast, it's industry stuff, uh, or I'm trying to learn. Give language. us some names. Give us some names. Of some books or podcasts? Of podcasts. Podcasts? Or like. Honestly, the only podcast I really listen to are the ones that I'm going to be on <laughs> recently um, <laughs> because I'm just preparing for them. Other than that, I'll, I'll just I'll just prefer to disappear into my room and read some of these old science books or things like that. I'm just a super nerd. You know, I wish I was more exciting, but this is what you're dealing with, sister. Uh, I feel you. I feel like a total bookworm and just leave me with my books, leave me in my artist studio and that's all I need. Well, some food and maybe some sun. Um, yeah. what, what would you say is the book that changed your perspective, if I can say so? Well, that's a good question. Well, there's been a lot of them, but when I was first beginning my journey down this uh, occult path, you know, I was researching all of these guys. I was, re you know, I read everything I could find on Nikola Tesla. I actually gathered every paper he ever wrote and put it into one huge half gig PDF file. I can send it to you if you want. And uh, then I was like, okay. Please do so. I love Nikola Tesla. Oh my God, the yeah, genius. Yeah, it truly, yeah. And I, I read all his papers except for one, which I couldn't find. Um, I think it's probably with the Sierra or something. It was his theory on his dynamic theory of gravity in 1927. He delivered it orally at the Royal Immigrant Society in New York. I couldn't find that one. So I was trying to, you know, get the real truth about the guy. So I said, okay, this stuff is not available to me. Let me go back and see who were his mentors. What was he reading? 
right? But you have to kind of reverse engineer it if you want to figure out what's going through these guys' heads. A lot of these brilliant dudes are straight weirdos, you know? So his his mentor was a guy named William Crooks, who's again, one of these Royal Institute guys, really interesting dude, brilliant guy. You know, it's Crooks tubes and all these little science stories you see were invented by him, but he was a deep spiritualist and a brilliant mind. So I went back and read him, and then I got into the whole Royal Institute. I went down that rabbit hole. But, you know, before I really went deep into that, I, I was really looking for something to really flavor my understanding in general about what the hell is going on. And I found this one book. Um, I forget exactly how I found out about it. But I, I, I know that one of my mentors at the time, a guy by the name of Tom Brown, American dude who had this amazing podcast called Borderland Sciences, you still find it online. He's a brilliant man. And he told me about this one book. He said, hey, man, you should read this. He, he's like a hippie kind of dude, right? Uh, American. I don't know where he is right now. I think he's in New Zealand. He said, bro, you should read this one book by uh, uh, Gunter Wachsmuth, who was the last great biographer of the great Rudolf Steiner. Rudolf Steiner was the Austrian mystic that uh, uh, invented the uh, Waldorf schools and things like Eurythmy. This Steiner was an epic, epic mystic. He wrote 300 volumes on everything from farming to dance to education to Egyptology to electricity, just everything. This guy was a different level. And uh, he was Austrian, so you know how those dudes write. Those homeboys will take 300 pages to say something that an American could say in one paragraph. So his students actually did a much better job of distilling his ideas down. Uh, he had this one book called The Philosophy of Freedom, which is one of the hardest reads in my life. It feels like he's trying to reprogram your brain. But anyway, this book by Gunther Wachsmuth, who was his last student before he died, it's called Etheric Formative Forces in Earth, Cosmos, and Man. And I was searching for this thing. It's been like 80 years out of print. And uh, I finally found a copy of it in the Yale library. And I managed to get it. And I read it. I can send you the PDF if you want. I read that and it totally blew me away. I, I had to read it several times. And I keep re kept rereading it as my journey progressed. Okay. So the, the next book I, I would suggest... The next book that I read that really sent me down the next level of the rabbit hole was uh, Man or Matter by Ernst Lairs, who was another student of uh, Rudolf Steiner. And then from there, you know, it was just, just straight Victorian uh, Royal Institute stuff. <laughs> Literally maybe a hundred of those books. And I, I can name those names, but if you just start off with those two books, Their Formative Forces by Earth, uh, in Earth, Cosmos, and Man, by uh, Gunter Wachsmuth and Man or Matter by Ernst Lairs, it will completely recondition your thinking in a beautiful way. How many countries have you traveled? Oh, uh, I don't know. Uh, or how many do you actually miss to complete the entire world? I haven't been to Antarctica yet. I've been to pretty much... Uh, Actually, there's, there's quite a few. I have a lot more work to. I've been to maybe seven or countries in Africa. I go there often, but I want to go to all the smaller countries like Malawi, Chad, Niger, Senegal, Cameroon, all of these places. Um, I, I've been to most of the countries in South America and Latin America, but there's still more work to do. Maybe I think 50 more countries and I'll cover the vast majority of the world. <laughs> Wow. What sports do you love? Do you love outdoors or indoors? Uh, I, I didn't grow up playing any real sports. I was a major nerd, um, real nerd. The only the book sport, sports. Yeah, the book sports. <laughs> yeah. The only sports that I got into were uh, boxing and MMA. Um, I liked them because I never really got into team sports. I was just too nerdy. I, I was really turned off as a kid by how passionate people were about football and basketball and baseball. And they knew so much about this stuff and I knew all the stats. I'm like, man, you guys know so much about this stuff that's fucking meaningless. And you, you know nothing about the things that actually matter. And I just kind of rebelled by not caring about that. But I, I liked boxing. I liked MMA because... It tested the soul, 
and uh, you kind of feel like something is settled afterwards, if that makes any sense. Absolutely. What cuisine is your favorite? Uh, I have to say I like Indian food. These Ayurvedic spices are genius. I like Japanese food. It's not sushi. I mean, I like sushi and sashimi, but like simple food, like, uh, you know, a mackerel and a bowl of rice and <laughs> a beer. That's That was like my standby for a long time. Korean food is great. Kimchi, which I make myself sometimes. Fermented foods, uh, you know, good marinated meats. I'm a simple guy, but mostly Asian food. Thai, Thai, Korean, Japanese, Indian. I had to put it at the top of the list. What is in your bucket list in this lifetime? It can be travel, it can be seeing cultures, it can be achieving anything. What is in your bucket list? Well, one of those things I just recently crossed off. I always wanted to uh, at least like interact with a, a great cat, like a lion or a tiger and a Uh, this is one cat here. Her, she's a like six-month-year-old albino lion. She's at this ranch this guy has here in Dubai. And her name is Morocco. And I'm gonna go over and feed her tomorrow. And I really like her. She's like my girlfriend now, I guess. <laughs> But I love animals, and I, I just wanna <laughs> I want to cuddle a baby elephant. That'd be nice. <laughs> so, so one is almost off your bu your bucket list because you're going tomorrow to feed. Well, I've already seen her several times, but I want to kind of win her trust here and have a, a real personal relationship with one of these uh, apex predators. You know, they're I'm Egyptian, so I guess I have a connection with them. Um, that's almost off my bucket list. I would like to build 100 schools. Uh, and again, the well, it, you know, after the whole fintech journey, and that's a big one, um, liberating the world of money. I really believe I'll have a part to play in the world of, I hate to use the word science, because I think it's been a polluted world. I think science is, what we call now science is really a cult of scientism that leverages mathematics or mythematics a little way too much. Uh, I would use the term natural philosophy, like the great Victorians called it, Nikola Tesla, Isaac Newton, etc. I really believe I can bring something amazing there that, I don't think God would have guided me on a journey to absorb that level of knowledge for so long unless I was really going to do something there. So, you know, that there's a lot on that list. Uh, but even the most meager of the rediscoveries there could result in completing the work of Nikola Tesla and all of these Victorians. And I'm not going to, you know, name anything in specific, but all those dreams, those fantastical dreams that humanity has had, They should all have been a reality by now. We should already have had unlimited energy, flying cars, unlimited water, you know, ways to heal every known disease. We should already have had this by now if it wasn't actively suppressed. So I believe I can play a part in bringing that back. Call me crazy. That's what I believe in my heart. Uh, that's I call you crazy. <laughs> Yeah. Talking about flying cars, I know you love cars. So, it, wouldn't you? Wouldn't you go to the space, into the space, or to the moon if you had the pos possibility? Nah, it's not in your bucket list. Nah. No, I don't yeah. care at all. I have absolutely no, <laughs> no desire to go to outer space, the moon, Mars, or whatever. You know, stay on Earth. After I die. Well, after we die, right, that, that's when we really, when we leave this body, that's when we can go to the next level. I'm aiming for nothing less than Saturn. That's the body or planetary projection of the seventh heaven. That's the highest heaven. I'm aiming for that, sister. Inshallah. Okay. I'll end it like that. A little cryptic, but whatever, man. I'm, I'm not going <laughs> down that road right now. Sorry. <laughs> but just, yeah. Yeah, yeah. How was your life during pandemic? I know you were still traveling, but otherwise, did, did the rhythm change? Was your connection to people changed or it nothing changed for you personally? Well, it was really good for me, actually. It was, uh, I was in a 
bad marriage. I, I got divorced, thankfully. Uh, God guided me out of that. I didn't expect this whole COVID thing to come out like that. I did not see this coming, but when it happened, I wasn't surprised. Um, it forced me to really spend some time with myself, which was good. Uh, it was good. You know, I stayed in good shape. I got into the best shape of my life during COVID because I could spend some time with myself. I cut a lot of people out of my life as well that were sucking away my energy. If you're an empath and you're listening to this, oh, never ever feel bad about cutting people out of your life. You, we really have to be very, very guarded with our energy. Really, it is our most valuable resource. Just having anyone within a meter of you, you know, the, the energy is so important. That's why I can't go to parties with all these people. It's extremely draining, right? And it made me really appreciate that about myself and to protect my borders better, which is, is a, a lesson that I needed. I agree with you. I mean, in certain time of our lives, we, we get to that point where we we have to learn to protect ourselves in some way. And, and when you start cutting off certain um, people with certain habits, you just you regain your own freedom and just fly. You regain your speed, right? Yeah. yeah, it feels good. You're like, oh, wow, I was missing that the whole time. You almost forget how you used to be like, right? Like... Yeah. So let's talk about NFTs. How much are you into NFTs? And what would be your recommendation for people questioning get into not get into what to do what to know what not to yeah i've been gifted some nfts i, I do have someone that is kind of managing my MT, nft portfolio right now and it's been successful at this point um i i don't really care about acquiring nfts myself if anything i would like to build a product that makes NFTs more accessible to the people. That means studying what's currently out there, like OpenSea, uh, LooksRare, whatever it might be, and doing better, because I, I do think it's amazing technology. It's just, just getting started. I think there's a whole new world for NFTs out there. I think the good guys have to really put some love into NFTs, because otherwise it's just gonna become another money grab full of scams and it's going to distract us away from what's really important which is bitcoin so i i'm calling out to all the good guys out there i know you've heard a lot of nfts don't be shy start educating yourself about it start using these websites and products nfts and start learning about it um, most of them i mean it, what's beautiful about them is that they're unlocking a lot of the, the artists around and putting them to work they're showing they're getting real appreciation right now it's basically the art world taken digitally, right? In a way that is proved verifiably real. That's it. But it's, again, prone to a lot of the uh, hacks and abuses that art has been used for for a long time. Uh, art has been used for money laundering and tax evasion since art was around. And NFTs are continuing that tradition. There's a lot of good they can do as well, but we don't know what that is because, hey, we just started. So get out there and start learning. NFTs are the future. It's happening right now. I don't suggest betting the family farm on an NFT collection, whether it's, you know, queer vampires or, you know, puffy bears or pudgy penguins or whatever it might be. But do start learning about it. Um, you know, I've been working on this car project for a while. Um, I redesigned the Shelby Cobra <laughs> inside and out. It's quite beautiful uh, that's being made right now by a pretty awesome team. And I was thinking about making an NFT, but I don't know. I, I'm a very ethical person. I, I don't want to put out an, or put out a token. I've never done an ICO because to me, I have an ethical responsibility to make sure whatever I do is backed, is ethical, is backed by proof of work, is, is not going to make people poor. It'll make them richer, if anything. So I have a bit of a contention there within my own self. So I don't think I'm the best person to advise there for now. Okay, thank you. Is there anything you would do differently in in back looking back in the past, having the experience and knowledge that you have now? 
yeah, you know, a lot of people say I have no regrets in this life, but I do have regrets. And uh, my regret has always been that I didn't spend enough time with my family, didn't spend enough time with uh, the women in my life, that I, I should have been more emotionally available to them, more supportive of them, instead of just being selfish and so focused on my own knowledge and building things. That's my only real regret. I, I wish the people that truly loved me that I gave them more of myself. But I have started doing that now. So that's from the heart, sister. This, thank you. This is very philosophical, but do you think you would have achieved what you have achieved if you tried to balance? Because you were, obviously, you were full into your project and fanatically just going after that. Do you think by balancing and having the time off would 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 you achieve what you have now? I mean, does some parts of our lives do some parts of our lives have to give in any way or not, or can we do everything? Because there is so much time, you know. It's a good question. Um and it comes back to what we understand, what is balance, right? What is balance to you? Now, if, if my father was more of a balanced person, and had you know, the family or social skills that you know, I wish I had, then I would have understood balance a lot better. And I believe I would be able to do everything I've done now and do amazing things as well. But because I lacked that role model in my life and that, you know, that, that uh, conditioning from the start, I had to go on my own journey and I had to reach the palace of wisdom through the road of excess. And that's just my journey, right? <laughs> we don't get everything, right? Like God gave me a lot of tools, but some were missing. So I had to go on and figure them out for myself. I never really had a mentor growing up and men like that are always seeking father figures in some way. I saw minds through dead scientists and <laughs> dead revolutionaries <laughs> through books and that's just my path i had to put a lot of time into that and there wasn't much time for other things right so i had to go on that journey but if i had a balanced role model and i had all those things just primed and ready and there waiting for me it would have been a different story but i'm thankful some people don't have a father at all or a mother at all or any family or any guidance ever so i'm thankful absolutely <laughs> What would you tell to your 20-year-old self or even 11-year-old self? I, or, I mean, you started business so early. What would you say to your younger self? Yeah, if I could write a book for my younger self or my son for that matter, it'd be to absolutely believe in myself. Like all those crazy ideas that I had and the fact that I was always so alone and never felt part of the group, and just like, man, fuck the group, and you are on the right path. They're on the wrong path. You know, some of us are guided by this sense of intuition. It almost feels like a nagging, scratching on the inside of our skull that something is wrong, and I don't feel comfortable being with these people, and I hate this small talk. And oh my God, these people enjoy watching these sports and hanging out and drinking beers and going to nightclubs, it feels wrong to me. And I would say, man, yeah, you're right. Follow your instincts, man. All that shit is total crap. We're in a game, right? We're in this, 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 this video game designed by the creator and all these things are distractions. You're on the path. Just believe in yourself and keep building and always put yourself first. Because especially if you're an empath, you tend to think there's a nobleness in giving away little be bits of yourself to everyone because you want to help everyone and that is not conducive to growth. That is not helping those people. Often, as you give those people too much of yourself, you end up destroying, not just hurting yourself, but you destroy them because they can't handle those things that you give them. You know, I've, I've, I've been on this journey a while right now and I've seen, I've seen that the test of wealth is greater than the test of poverty. Most people have no chance of passing it whatsoever, and I always felt bad for them, and I tried to help, but ultimately we have to withdraw into ourselves and spend all those resources on 
what we really need to do. And I would just tell him, hey, bro, you are on a mission. God gave you something to do. You are not like everyone else, and that is okay. Be loyal to that mission. It will become clear. And the, if you'll know when you've found it, because it'll be the craziest, most epic thing ever, and you'll be an alien, but that's okay. That's just what you are. Enjoy it. I have a few more questions, and then we can wrap up and maybe get to Q&A if we still have some time. Uh, what will be your next startup? Uh, it's a great question. Um, I mean, uh, well, I want to do a lot more in fintech. You know, Paxful is an amazing brand. It's an amazing mission. There's other things that need to be created to help this mission. It's ultimately a mission-driven. It's not about one single company. It's about the mission. Paxful is the best hopes of achieving that mission. But there's other things that need to happen as well. And I love building products. But uh, after the whole finance part of the journey, or at least during, getting to the science, right, and introducing these amazing groundbreaking products and things that humans every single day, whether it be you know, a car, a pair of shoes, an electric jet, whatever it might be, I believe that's the next part of my mission. So I want to get back to physical reality again, and engineering that changes the game. And I believe that'll be my next startup. I think cars are a great place to start. I think Elon Musk was on the right track when he did that. I'm not going to be doing any electric cars, at least not electrical in the way that we think. Electric cars are 140-year-old technology. The electric car was invented in 1838. By 1888, we had them in mass production. By 1914, we had regenerative braking, and every lawyer in New York had an electric car. Then it just got wiped out for 100 years, and now it's back, which make intelligent people question things. What's going on? Why would this technology be introduced back now when it was suppressed for so long? There's a lot at play here. but my next phase of startups will be to <clears throat> change the narrative away from science or rather scientism back to natural philosophy and introducing products to humans, pretty epic products that humans can use every single day that we didn't think would be conceivable in our lifetime. Under that, <laughs> can't go too deep into that one now. <laughs> I'm with you on the journey to bring back natural science into our world and daily life. I have a question from co-host and podcast producer Tanmay, who's unfortunately couldn't get on here, um, about India. He is in India and from India, and, and so crypto is not banned in India. And it is just 30% taxable. Mm. What would be your advice to, to the listeners in India, how they can start their journey in crypto? Buy some Bitcoin right now. Buy some Bitcoin, hold on to it. You can go on to Paxful and you can see all the amazing things you can get for your Bitcoin. But right now, get some Bitcoin right away. Stay away from all the other stuff. No, Ethereum, USDT, fine, but do not start gambling your money on Dogecoin, Chibo, or any of that other nonsense. Just become a Bitcoiner. Understand why Bitcoin is so important. Educate yourself on the Bitcoin standard and why Bitcoin is the greatest technological revolution of our times. That's it. Focus on that. Bitcoin, Bitcoin, Bitcoin. It is the replacement for gold. It is something that the Indian people have taken too wholeheartedly, and I think just India and Africa alone can change the entire world. And I think they can be. I think every city in India can be like Dubai, and every city in Africa can be as developed as Dubai in just ten years if we all really embrace this technology. So start by getting some, and spend every waking moment understanding Bitcoin. That's all. Stay away from the junk. Important. Stay away from the junk, learn Shikoli, about yeah. Bitcoin, and start now. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Um, people who would love to support 
Pax Nigra or or anything you do, how can they do that? Do, can they call it like donate for charity? Any how they can participate? Uh, you can donate to Built with Bitcoin. Uh, you can send any type of crypto there, and we'll turn it into a school. We can do a well. You can contact the folks at Built with Bitcoin, and you know, it's an amazing team. I think like ninety. It was 100% goes to actual the ground. Now it's like 96%, but that's like the in, can be exact opposite of any other charity where 96% goes to paying people at desks. Only a meager fraction goes to helping the people. Uh, that's cool. But even cooler than that is just support support us. You know, if you see a tweet by us, retweet it, engage, you know, really come to appreciate Bitcoin, educate yourself about it. Educate your friends about it. Become that one friend in your circle that understands Bitcoin is pushing your friends around you to know Bitcoin and spread that. It's so important. Again, there's a huge distinction between Bitcoin and cryptocurrency. I'm talking about Bitcoin. It's a completely different animal than cryptocurrency. Bitcoin is the truth. The rest is noise. And noise is dangerous, especially in a world full of distractions. You can lose yourself. You can lose sight of the mission. Stay focused on Bitcoin. Become that Bitcoin friend and spread it around. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for your wisdom, your knowledge, your experience, sharing all that with us today. Thank you so much, Ray. You're such an inspiration and such a great energy. Thank you so much. Thank you, sister. I appreciate your words, your great questions. And your awesome work with NFTs. You're kicking major ass. Massive respect. Thank you. Thank you. And I don't know, do you have uh, 10, 15 minutes for Q&A from the public? Or Okay. Yeah? yeah. Okay. Fantastic. So I'm going to open the stage and raise your hand and you will get, to, you will get the chance to ask your question to Ray. Um, also, I had a question. If somebody would like to contact you uh, for, I don't know, for business or whatever the reason, what is the best way to do so? Is it email or social media? I'm pretty responsive on social media. I'm Ray Paxful on Twitter, on Telegram, on Instagram, on WeChat. Just reach out and say hi. But uh, don't just say hi. Like, Give me a message first if you want me to take some action on something, a cohesive message, and I, I can make things happen. If there's some feedback about the product. I'm always open to that as well. All right. So we have Bitcoin Soul. Bitcoin Soul. Do you do you have a question? Oh yeah, I have a question. Do, do, do you want to present yourself and then your question? Okay. Uh, good, good day. Uh, my name is uh, Abdul Momin. I'm from Nigeria. I'm one of uh, Paxu vendor, and I've been trading on Paxu for the past um, four to five years. Uh, great man, Mr. Ray, thank you very much for speaking to us. It's always inspirational to listen to you. Also inspirational to... Uh, uh, Follow and uh, follow what you've been doing in the crypto space. Uh, my question is about uh, regulations. Uh, just recently, we heard the news about uh, our Binance uh, freeze about 281 accounts of Nigerian descent. What do you think is going to happen in future when the aspect of regulation comes in, comes in especially? In regards to centralized uh, exchanges, so does that does would that not affect the basic principle of uh, Bitcoin? Give power that be have control over exchanges. Would that not alter the principles of uh, uh, Bitcoin and uh, blockchain, so to say? I hope you get my question. Yeah, thanks, brother. Um... Yeah, so Bitcoin is permissionless. We can use Bitcoin between ourselves. The only reason that people use exchanges is to exchange big crypto Bitcoin for other forms of crypto and speculate on that. And they also use exchanges 
to convert the crypto into other forms of fiat, right? So it becomes fiat money, right? That part is where the regulators are really squeezing. They're squeezing Binance very, very hard right now. Binance is under a regulatory attack from around the world, right? Paxful is peer-to-peer. -peer. Uh, we're fully compliant. We're an American company, which is presents its own challenges. Unfortunately, American compliance is very rough. You know, when you mention Africa to, Bitcoin, to American regulators, you see their faces kind of twist up which is unfortunate, um, but it's a battle, it really is. You know, we have to stay ahead of the race, and that means education. That means not depending on exchanges. That means not keeping your Bitcoin on exchanges, whether it's Binance, Paxful, or whatever. You should only use them as places to do exchanges, not to hold your Bitcoin. You should control your own keys. Great question. Um, no. Yes, we go with you, Samuel. Then we have Ger Germanium. I hope I pronounced that right. And then we have Oluwa. So All right. Go um, yeah, good, everyone. Um, hello, Ray. Um, nice to see you here. I met you in Dubai. Hope you can remember. Uh, and also good to see uh, Tone Vays, right? Okay, I, I have a question, right? Um. We've seen governments around the world, you know, you know, they're bringing up um, laws to make uh, uh, Bitcoin or crypto in general taxable, so you can have tax on crypto. Uh, most especially the news that just came out of India recently. So the question is, do you think Bitcoin is going to face um, what gold faced in 1971? Do you think it's going to repeat itself? Well, the dollar is not backed by gold anymore, right? And they went after all the people holding gold and, and tried to control the flow of it, the custody of it. You see the same thing happening now with Bitcoin. It's going to keep happening. This is, yeah, we're at a very sensitive point in the world right now. I mean, you see what's happening. The United States is entering into a proxy war with Russia. Actually, they've been doing that for a while. It could be a hot war at any time. Regulators are clamping down. They want more and more control because they see the world starting to spin out of their control. You start seeing all this peer-to-peer, -peer, whether it's money, whether it's barter, whether you know just human interaction, real earnest human interaction, information sharing, humans talking to each other, socializing with each other, and they're trying to stop it with lockdowns, with social distancing. It's a pretty clear pattern here. So all I can say is we just have to be strong. and That means getting in touch with ourselves. I know it's kind of a corny answer, but there's no other way about it. We have to first recognize that we're in a spiritual battle. And whether it's a control of money, whether it's a real physical war, control of media, all of these things are just ways to keep the human mind under control, under their control, keep us locked in. Can't let that happen. Let's start asking our own questions. Okay, thank you, um, Ger Germanium. Yeah, so uh, my question is a little bit uh, personal about um, Paxful. You know, it has been like um, a very great exchange in Nigeria. It's just sad that um, we have a stricter uh, regulation here. But I want Paxful team to like um, reassess the verification method, you know, KYC. The, the documents that we are supposed to like use to um, verify on Paxful is not like that um, accessible in Nigeria again. You know they do like um, government ID every four, um, every four years, I guess. So and then to get a, a driver's answers, you have to like um, go through a whole lot of stress. I, I don't think if there's a if Paxful can just like review a better way of um, doing the verification stuff, it will make a whole lot of sense. Yeah, KYC is a huge problem. You know, and everyone uses these KYC providers in America, whether it's Jumio, Onfido, or Net Netmind, or whatever, and they do a decent job of verifying Americans or Europeans. But when it comes down to Chinese or Russians, non-alphabets, they fail. 
when it comes to places like Africa or Nigeria, for example, where less than a fraction of 1% have passports, less than a fraction of 1% even have driver's licenses, less than a fraction of 1% even have plastic ID cards. Most people have a little voter registration card made of paper without a picture. They don't know how to handle that. So the, the challenge is on us as an exchange, as a marketplace uh, to, to hook into these local identity verification systems. But it's, it's literally one country at a time, right? You have to sign a deal with Smile ID in Nigeria to be able to do it right for Nigerians. You have to do the same thing with Ghana and Egypt and Malawi. And, you know, the list just goes on and on. And this is really the biggest pain point. This is one of the reasons why it's so hard to onboard people in the global south. Because even if people do have IDs, we don't really have the tools to verify them unless we have deals with every specific, uh, you know, uh, aggregator verifier in that specific country. So localized KYC is an immense challenge. It's probably the biggest challenge there is out there, and it's one step at a time. So it's a great question. Wish I had a better answer. Thank you. Thank you, Ray, for your time. Thank you so much. My pleasure, sister. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Great questions. Thank you for listening in. Do connect with us on Twitter and Instagram for updates of new shows and to participate with us. All the links have been mentioned in the show notes. Another thing, we have got some amazing NFTs for you. I have a collection of 3D animated, abstract and figurative NFTs. If you want to have an immersive experience of my artworks, I would insist you to visit my virtual gallery. Laura's collection is a fusion of fashion and art NFTs inspired from our own fashion shows and her unique art style. If you want to know how to buy your NFT or if you want to know how to create one, do get in touch. Cheers.